Welcome, everyone. This is Shaper Sessions. My name is Jake. And I'm Russ. And welcome to part two of our candy machine build. So a part or part by part, three step process, three sessions long process. Uh, last time we did all of the wooden parts. So we got our stack of parts here. Hopefully you have your stack of parts at home. And today we're moving on to cutting plastics, especially acrylic with Shaper Origin. Uh, the goal for this three-part series is to walk you through step-by-step -step how to do literally everything we're doing to make this project. Our goal is to just have some people make some successful projects because yep. uh, it can be a little intimidating to get started, you know? Yeah. Um, we're going to show you some mistakes along the way. Specifically today, we're going to talk a lot about router bits, different types of router bits, what you can use them for, especially in the context of plastics. Yeah, and we're also going to tap into grid, which is a really key function of origin and setting up a workspace. Yeah, you might remember the last show, we just set all of our stuff up flat, no grid, we just kind of eyeballed things. Today, we're going to grow on that in two steps. We're going to do a very simple, quick grid for this first piece, and then we're going to do an even more complex, like solid XY dimension grid and uh, show you a couple of tricks to save on material for your projects, which everybody loves to do. Stuff's expensive. It is. Um, as always, this is a live show, so please get your questions in. We will go through them at the Q&A at the end. And during our Mitchell break, go ahead and answer the poll question that pops up. Question for the day is... What is the question for the day? It's, you know, okay, here we are. We're starting with this project. And this project was recommended to us by Bo, one of our forum members. But we're curious what you think we should teach as a first project for origin owners, new origin owners specifically. Um, so, yeah. you know, if you've got experience, tell us what you did that went well. If you don't own an origin, tell us what you would like to see from us to get you started. Um, what project would you recommend we teach to new origin owners? And again, that poll question is going to come up halfway through the show. We're giving you a little bit of a head start to think about it. Um, but answer that poll question when it pops up, and that's going to enter you into the giveaway that we do during that Q&A for our live viewers at the end of the show. Sweet. That was a mouthful. That was. I think we should get started with a demo. <laughs> All right. What do I have in front of me? I have a MDF spoil board so that I don't cut it into my tabletop. And I have a piece of eighth inch clear acrylic with a paper backing on it still. That is double sided taped down. We have about three strips going all the way across. And we have our shaper tape laid out. You can see here up at the top, it's a little bit more dense just because it's a short board and we're cutting a tall object. So when we get to the top of that shape, we want to make sure that there's plenty of dominoes in our view. Yep. Jake has already scanned this and you may see that this setup is really familiar to the setup we did on the last show. So if this is brand new to you, if this is the first of the series that you're watching, or if you say, hey guys, slow it down a minute. After the show, go back and watch that other show. Um, and we'll rehash everything that we did to get this set up scanned in in the first place. But since we covered that in the last show, we're going to fast forward past that part. We're going to show you a new trick, which is the double click grid. And this is part of setting up your file so that if you need to make changes in the future, you can still kind of eyeball things as you place them. But if you need to re change things in the future, you can always go back to this new double click grid and replace your files. All right, we're in the design tab. We're going to come down here on the left-hand side to grid. We're going to hit new grid. Set depth. We and don't even need to set our depth for yeah. this one. We're just skipping that entirely. And just a quick one, two on the green button. And there we go. Double click. If you do it too slow, it's going to say, hey, you didn't double click. <laughs> but if you double click, it's going to be just right. But what this has given us is a nice clear XY coordinate, which I am currently hovering over the zero, zero point. Now we have X and Y readout here. And as I move around, it will tell me exactly where I am on that grid. Mm -hmm. But this zero, zero point is all we care about for right now. Yep. And one important note about this grid is that it's not in reference to anything other than wherever origin has to be pointing at the time that you make the grid. Uh, it's not in reference to any edge in particular. We're going to show you how to make an edge reference grid in the second half of this show. Yeah. This is more of a placeholder grid, we could call it. Yeah, exactly. 
All right, so we're going to hop into import now. We're going to bring in that same file from Shaper Hub. Because remember last time it had that center piece, which is the acrylic. That's actually really convenient for placing this Very. on the grid. I'm going to grab a different anchor point. We're going to move from the center to the bottom anchor point. Bottom, middle. And you're just going to place that at zero, zero? At zero, zero, just so it's nice and easy to remember. remember. Place. There we go. OK, now I think before we move on to cutting, I know we like to cut as fast as we can. Keeps the energy up. But before we move on, I just want to show what makes this grid so cool. So if you were just eyeballing things, lining them up by eye, there's no way that you would be able to place two files exactly on top of each other exactly the same way every time. And we've got high standards for this. We've got standards mm -hmm. in like the thousands of an inch because this is a CNC machine at the end of the day. Yeah. But let's show the people what happens if you import that same file again and put it on this zero, zero point. Let's say you change the diameter of these screw clearance holes. Yeah, or you decided you want to add some different flare or flurry to this front screen. So we remove that, back to import, same process, grab that bottom middle anchor point, and drop it right on zero, back zero. in the same place. And if you had already cut some of these features, you would be able to go back and pick up right exactly where you left off, even though you had deleted the file that you're working on. Yeah. So True this benefit. is the power of the double-click grid. Sometimes even if you don't think you need to or you're not going to adjust your file, you should still do this process because the time you don't is when you're going to need it. Yep, that's right. Okay, enough about that. Enough about that complicated grid nonsense. Let's go ahead and cut this. Yeah, I think the first thing we cut, just to keep it simple, is going to be this through hole for yeah. the handle. Yeah, and we're using the standard eighth inch cutter that comes in the box. Mm -hmm. um, what I am going to do is I'm going to turn my spindle speed down mm -hmm. to about a three, and I'm going to helix this particular hole. Yep, we talked about helix on the last show. Um, again, that is any cut path that stays entirely within Origin's corrective range can be helixed, which is completely automatic movement. Okay. Glasses on. Yeah, let's let it rip. This is going to be a fast one. There we go. There it is. Let's get Doesn't look like an acrylic faceplate yet, but that's the first step. And always, whenever we make a cut, we check it. Now, this hole I know is supposed to be oversized, but we do want to make sure that it fits this dowel that goes through it. There are other parts of this build that constrain that dowel, but that's perfect. It fits. Excellent. We got a lot more holes. Let's keep it rolling. Let's come we over to one of the screw holes. Eight of these screw holes, yeah. And I'm, try I'm highlighting that smaller hole on the inside, and I'm not seeing a cut path. Okay, and we wanted to show this to you guys because this is one of our number one most asked questions. Why am I not seeing the cut path? And the reason for that, 99% of the time, is that your router bit is too big. Mm -hmm. Origin's going to say, hey, that hole is too small for an eighth inch router bit, so I'm not going to let you cut it because it would be screwing up your project. So it just doesn't show the cut path. Uh, what we have is a 16th inch router bit. Jake's going to swap out that 8th inch router bit, put the 16th inch in there, and you're going to see how that cut path, as soon as we change that router bit, shows right up. This is a 16th inch straight flute bit. Not that long. It's like a half inch long or so. We've got 8th inch material, though, so plenty, more than enough. Yeah. Okay, and of course, back into the screen to tell Origin that our bit size is 16th. I can even do that just to figure out what that crazy decimal that calculator is. calculator is so handy. And Z-Touch. Nice. Bingo.
Perfect. And whenever you change a tool or whenever you take that spindle in and out, that's the first thing that you're going to want to do is double check your bit diameter and Z-touch. Excellent. Now we can see, it's very tiny, but you should be able to see a couple of swirling ants inside that smaller hole. All right. That's a cut path. You're ready to rip. Let's so do it. we're going to cut these down to full depth. It's going to be helix. It's going to be all helix. Um, we can yeah. ramp up the speed a I little bit. Maybe. Just did that. Yeah, I bumped okay. it up to 15 inches. I'm down here for the sake of the show timing. I changed my auto speed to 15 instead of 10. And that's just going to speed up the auto uh, helix speed. Yep. Okay. And we've got eight holes to do. So I'm going to step off to the side here, let you cut those out, and right. we'll see how it looks. See you in a sec. Cool. So one of our most asked questions answered, what is going on if I don't see that cut path? And the answer there most likely is that your router bit is too big for the path somewhere. The cool thing about Origin is that it automatically calculates all that stuff for you so it prevents you from making mistakes. The hard thing there is if you don't know what's going on, it can be confusing. So um, we just fixed that in this case with that 16th inch router bit. Now Jake is helixing these out. Helix again is a super cool feature of Origin that lets you cut holes like this much more quickly than if you were doing them by hand. Um, we kind of call Origin our favorite drill press in the shop just for this reason, because for zipping out holes of a strange size in just the right place, you really can't beat it. So these are clearance holes for number four wood screws. And then after we cut all of these clearance holes, we're gonna come back with a 90 degree engraving bit and use that to cut the countersinks for each one of these holes. As always, ask any questions that come up in the chat. Ted will answer as many as he can in the moment and any ones that need a demo, he's gonna to send to us and we will answer those at the end of the show. There we go. Cool. Ten holes. Ten holes. More than I thought. Candy's not going anywhere. Nice. So we're swapping that out now for this 90 degree engraving bit. Yeah. And you had a little diagram. I did have a little diagram. So, all right. We've got our depth. We've got our cut type. We've got our diameter. And we've got to figure out how all of these things come together to make a nice countersink for a hole. Um, for this, we're going to use an inside cut. And we're actually going to put a small diameter on that router bit, uh, a 0 0.02 inch diameter, which is kind of our default engraving diameter. And you might wonder why that is. Okay, so I've got a diagram here. I think the best place to show this off would be on the overhead cam, probably. Can we show that? You see that okay? Nice. So when we've got an engraving bit, these, as sharp as they might feel or look, they don't actually come to a full point at the end there is a little flat area on the end of this router bit, and we're gonna call the flat area of that router bit 0 0.02 inches. Now, if we were to cut this right at zero, okay, you could imagine a dotted line right there. If I'm countersinking this hole, you're gonna have a little step at the bottom of that countersink, but if I put in that router bit diameter, 0 0.02 inches, that's gonna bump that inside cut just over so that my countersink is all angle and no flat. That's what we're looking for here. Nice. And for our depth? For our depth, um, for screws, you know, different screws have different head heights. So I think we sneak up on this one. Okay. Maybe we call it 0 0.05 to start and see where that gets us. What do you think? Let's see it. So in my depth, entering 0 0.05. The other thing I'm noticing is this larger hole is not where we're countersinking. We're countersinking the same We're countersinking same the hole. inner hole. Yeah. yeah. I would ignore that outer hole completely. Cool. More of a uh, show, more of a, you know, guideline than anything else. And when I did this earlier, I actually kept helix mode on for this. There you go. Or, you know what? Mm, 
Let's turn it off. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I'm <laughs> waffling there. Okay. I remember I did this exact same thing. I was like, oh, turn Helix on. And then I turned it off and I used auto mode instead. Yeah. The reason for that is, I'll give you the background behind this. Helix mode calculates the depth per revolution, the depth per helix, based on the router bit diameter that you put in. Hmm. So, so a quarter a inch router bit is <laughs> going to step down a certain amount. An eighth inch router bit is going to step down half that. A sixteenth is going to step down half that. A 0.02 router bit is going to step down a tiny, tiny amount every single helix. And that's going to just take forever. So uh, okay. I'd use auto mode for Good this one. Call. And I think we just do one and we check. I have see how my it works. screw right here. Perfect. Nice. How do we do on that? My test for screws is I try to put them in upside down and see how the diameter fits. Look for my little brush. That feels pretty darn good. Yeah, bump it up a little more, or is that right on the money? I think that's perfect. Okay, we'll call that 0 0.05. 0 0.05. All right, well, I'll give you a little space so we don't get too much router noise. All right. And uh, go ahead and cut the rest. Countersinks are fun. For this, we're using a 90-degree engraving bit. Uh, you also could use a countersinking bit. Um, these come in, it's kind of funny, they come in 90 and 82 degrees, which is a funny number, depending on where you get your screws from. But those are both pretty close. I've never had a problem with any crossover, so we're just using this 90 degree engraving bit. You can get that at shapertools.com. It's also very handy for other applications, engraving specifically. Now you'll see Jake's using auto lock mode for this. We talked a little bit about auto mode in the last show, which is where you hold down that green button. We really like that for when you're going around a corner with Origin. To enable auto lock mode, you just double tap that green button when you start a path, and you're going to see Jake, uh, when he starts the next path here, do that double tap. Here you go. Double tap. Now he's not moving Origin at all, but that spindle is moving around, you can see based on the dot moving around the screen and cutting that path completely automatically. So for a lighter cut where you don't want to use helix, doing an auto lock in a circle is a pretty solid idea as well. There we go. That's it. Beautiful. Great. I love that. It's so fast. <laughs> That's so fast. Imagine having to lay all that stuff out by hand oh. and then taking it to the drill press and like hoping you get the drill right on the center and for chamf everyone. Chamfering acrylic on a drill press or on a hand drill especially is a little not chattery. A little chattery. Yeah. Okay. So we've got all these holes. Next thing we got to do is cut out that profile. Now, we used the eighth inch stock router bit for the first hole that we did, and you could absolutely use the eighth inch stock router bit for cutting out this profile. We found, though, that we get slightly better results with O flute router bits in plastics, acrylic especially. So, for this, we're going to use our eighth inch by half inch O flute router bit. We've talked about our eighth inch by quarter inch O flute router bit a lot in the context of soft metals like brass. But plastic is so soft that you can go a little longer with that skinny router bit. Uh, that half inch length gets you a little more depth, obviously, even though we're only going an eighth inch deep. Gets you a little bit more clearance for those chips as well. Yeah, what is, is, it, is there a temperature thing as well? Does it build up less friction because of the single flute? Yeah, that's the goal with the single flute is less friction. The, um, I think technically we should, you know, we should have got the whiteboard out for this. Oh, yeah. But the O flute compared to, I mean, there are single flute bits also, like straight single flute bits. Uh, but the O flute gives you an even sharper edge than your standard one flute or two flute or three flute or whatever router bit. Uh, that's kind of the benefit of the O flute. Gives you a sharper edge and it evacuates those chips better. Um, for something like plastics, a sharp edge is going to last a really long time. Even for soft metals, a sharper O flute edge is going to last a really long time. It's really great on aluminum and brass. Um, 
But when you get to harder metals, which we don't recommend doing with Shaper Origin, but we're talking about like big CNC mills at this mm -hmm. point, I would never use an O-flute for that because that sharper edge is going to be less durable. That's right. the trade-off there. So for plastics, O-flute bit is awesome. Totally the way to go. This is also why we recommend that 5-millimeter O-flute bit for plywoods because it's yes. sharp, extra sharp, really zips through that plywood, even though it's way deeper of a cut than we would typically recommend somebody cut with a five millimeter bit. We yeah. recommend that people can cut even all the way down to like 20 millimeters with that. So that's the magic of O flutes. Alrighty. So I'm gonna go at this with a 0 0.02 roughing offset. Mm -hmm. Feel confident to go down to an eighth inch depth. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back in, and I might... Well, what do you think about holding auto for the finish pass? You could hold auto for the finish pass if you want. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. We'll, we'll see how Up this Up to one. you. Yeah. Give you... A, what you're going for there, right, is a little bit more consistent right. of an edge. Yeah. Right? You're less likely... I mean, you could sand the acrylic edges, but, you know, trying not to. So if we have auto lock on, we're going to have a really consistent edge all the way across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, I would go for that. The one thing to keep in mind for everybody watching is that plastics do tend to bunch up mm -hmm. a little bit uh, in a way that sawdust really doesn't. So if you see Jake stopping at all, I mean, I'll mention this if it happens, but, you know, might stop, might vacuum it out a little bit, might brush it out a little bit. And that's all completely normal. You can always hit the red button at any time. Just give it a pause. You can pick back up right where you left off. But yeah. we'll talk about that if it happens. Will you toss me a brush if you find one later? I will. Thank you. Okay. Gotcha. Here we go. All right, first got to find a brush, huh? Um, while I'm doing that, we can talk about cutting plastics a little bit more. As far as settings goes, I think of plastics as uh, something that I want to cut a little more slowly than wood. The reason for that is if you get wood too hot, it builds up a little bit of friction. Um, it may start to smoke, but it takes quite a while to get there. Uh, the worst thing that happens is you kind of resin up your router bit, and that stuff can be cleaned off pretty easily. Now, with plastics, they tend to melt quite a bit easier than wood. Okay, so let's think temperatures. Woods melt, uh, not melt, but burn in the four to 500 degree range. Plastics start to melt in maybe the two to 300 degree range. That's all Fahrenheit. Um, and so they're a little bit more sensitive to heat. Because they're a little bit more sensitive to heat, you want to go more slowly with them. That's why Jake, I believe, had his spindle set on spindle setting three. And he's going just at a pace that kind of feels good with that spindle. He's looking for a good feel that's not pushing him around too much. He's listening for a good hum in that spindle, not a, uh, not a shriek or not a chug-a-lug a rumble, if you will, just a nice hum in between. He's making sure that it doesn't smell like melting or burning plastic. And as long as all those things are good, we would call this a good cut. Uh, the other thing that we can look at when he's done with this is the chip quality to make sure that we've got nice flaky chips, not too big, not too chunky, not too small, and not too powdery. So you want a nice little flaky chip. There we go. That's that first pass. So taking a pause here, doing a little cleanup, checking on those chips. Are oh, you saving some chips for me? Thanks, buddy. And between your roughing and your finishing pass, it's never a bad idea to go ahead and give that a little bit of clean out because as you do that finishing pass, you want as little resistance as possible. That's gonna give you the best quality edge finish. For anybody who's new to Shaper Origin, this is our handheld CNC router for, we'll call it woodworking and more, because we're working on plastics today. And as Jake is moving this router around, the dot inside the crosshairs represents the center of the spindle. Origin keeps the center of that spindle automatically locked on to that dotted line, which is the center of the toolpath. Um, auto corrects for you as you move this thing around in space. And as long as he keeps that dot somewhere inside the circle, he's going to have a perfect cut every time. 
if for whatever reason that dot moves outside the circle, Origin will automatically retract and save Jake's work for him. So it's a CNC machine cooked into a handheld plunge router. Um, and I mean, we're coming around on the final stretch here. You've got just like an edge and a half to go. So you're gonna see the results. I would not trust myself to route straight lines like this by hand with a plunge router. I'll tell you that. didn't have any buildup. Pretty good. So sometimes what will happen, and I think what, honestly, when it's happened to me most is when I have the spindle speed a little higher, mm -hmm. this cut path will get packed up with chips, and I'll actually feel Origin's base kind of get stuck, and I need to ride up and over it, which we don't want to do. Um, that was good. I'm going to say that's the chips melting to each other. They Getting get all chunky. gummed up like that. Yeah, a little too hot. So turning that spindle speed down, you're on three today. Yeah. I think that's a good move. Felt good. And let's show these off. These are those chips that we were talking about. These are nice little flakes. Does that feel like a good chip to you? Yeah, it looks like a good chip. Let's look at those on the camera. That's a good chip. They're, uh, you know, nice, discreet, individual parts. Yeah, make a wish. <laughs> cool. Uh, let's let's nice. uh, pry this up. Oh, you know, I didn't get you a pry bar. There you go. Oh, I love when that happens. I cut through the plastic. But not the paper? But not the paper. <laughs> uh, that's a good cut right there. Boink. Nice. <laughs> what are you looking for? Hey, there you go. Yeah, cut towards your body, everyone. <laughs> Don't try this at home. There we go. Nice. Love that precise depth control. What do you think about that? That was grand. Yeah, you want to go for the peel reveal? Absolutely. If I can get it in one peel. Ooh. Pressure's on. Double there set tape for the assist. Nice. Nice. Those chamfers came out great, too. That's great. That's a good part. That's a good part. All right. All right. One down, one to go. Let's roll into the poll question. So time to pull that poll question up. Again, that poll question is going to be, you know, we're teaching this project for beginners this week mm -hmm. and the week before and the week after. But what project would you like to see us teach for new origin owners? There's a whole world out there. So answer that, you're going to be entered into our giveaway that we're going to do at the end of the show. Um, while everybody's answering that, we've got a couple things to talk about. As always, really exciting. <laughs> What's the first one? First one is the box challenge. Coming it's back. It's coming back. It is back. Round it two. It is back, right? It's live. It's, it's live. live right now. It's happening. <laughs> so we last did this, I think, two years ago now, the box challenge, right? Yeah. Last year we did a studio design challenge. We're bringing the box challenge back. All right, the prizes. I mean, let's get the exciting stuff going first. First prize, $1,000 to the Shaper store. Second prize, a Festool CT MIDI. Third prize, a package of clamps from Bessie. Um, all really, really great stuff. Yeah. Anyone can win. You can be an Origin owner or you cannot. You can use Origin in your project. You don't have to. Yeah. Um, all of that's gonna be online. And, you know, okay, here, I've got the website pulled up. Let's go to the website. We've got all the details on here. So if you want to learn more about this, check out shapertools.com slash box challenge. Goose, can we pull the laptop up here? Yeah, here we go. Shaper box challenge. How to enter. Let's scroll down. We'll get there. Um, the key is, okay, submit your entry with hashtag shaper box challenge on Instagram 
between now and February 29th with at least three photos. Okay? Um, the way that we're judging this, kind of three pillars of judgment, right? One is originality and design. The second is craftsmanship. The third is documentation. So photos, photos are good. You know what's even better? Process. Process, <laughs> yeah. A video. Yep. I was going for oh, a video. A video. <laughs> a video. <laughs> process. Process is great. Yeah. Uh, process in the video. I mean, a yes. video of the finished box is cool too. It could yeah. just be a video of the finished thing. But photos are great. Finished box, process, photo, video, all that stuff. The more the better. Back to the laptop if you don't mind. Okay. Here, are, I mean, these are just some boxes that we've plinked around with at HQ. These are some ideas to get you started. Uh, this is a little salt box, match box. Double dovetail box. I think there's a session that Andy did on this one. At minimum, it's on Shaper Hub. That's yeah. crazy. This is a classic Matt Kenny box. We've got a whole master class on box making from Matt Kenny on shapertools.com slash master class. Okay, here's those prizes again. Judging criteria, design, craftsmanship, documentation. Bam. Okay, that's it. That's everything there. Shaper box challenge. ShaperTools.com slash box challenge. Hashtag ShaperBox challenge on Instagram. Now till February 29th. Can't wait to see what we all make. Absolutely. Speaking of Masterclass. Yeah. Um, speaking of Matt Kenny Masterclass. This is all coming together. <laughs> um, Masterclass Live at the Florida School of Woodwork is sold out. But <laughs> just, I guess we're teasing you guys today. Let's go over to the website here. Um, I mean, this is awesome. We're so excited to do this. This is at the Florida School of Woodwork, um, March 15th and 16th. It is sold out. Okay, enough about that, Russ. I don't care that it's sold out. I still want to do this thing. Here's this button down here. You're going to want to click this. Get on the wait list because inevitably one or two people might cancel, especially if you're in the Florida region. No harm in getting on the wait list. The other thing that getting on the wait list does is it will notify you of future master classes. So if you live in like Denver and you're like, all right, when's the next master class in Denver going to be? Uh, get on this wait list and you might find out that there's one coming to Denver. Um, that's not, don't take my word for that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not promising Denver specifically, just a city that came to mind, but this is where you would find out about it. Get on the wait list so that you can hear it from your email first and register ASAP because these sell out. Yes. Cool. Regardless of that, we have a really exciting guest because we wanted to just hype this up. We're so excited to visit the Florida School of Woodwork. We have Kate from the Florida School of Woodwork here to join us. Uh, let's bring her on. Hey, Kate. Uh, hey, Kate. Good evening, everybody. Hey, <laughs> good evening. Um, thanks so much for hanging on. We know it's late over by you, um, but we're so excited to come to the Florida School of Woodwork and uh, learn about steam bending, marquetry, and mortise and tendon joinery. Yeah. Um, yeah. We yeah. wanted to bring you on just to talk about the school, um, talk about yourself. I mean, could you tell us a, a little about yourself, the school's origin story, all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I grew up in England, and my dad was a tinker, right? so it's, he's always doing things. And so when I moved to the United States, I ended up living in Old Dark and had a, I think that many of us have lived in these situations where I had a money pit house. Oh no. And I know, and every weekend it was, it was, what was the project are we going to do? And so I, started buying tools didn't know what to do with them and it's embarrassing to say that it was pre-youtube <laughs> and so I, I started building furniture and it kept falling apart rather embarrassingly and so we ended up going to the oregon college of arts and crafts for a while in in that process uh started making furniture, stopped falling apart. And then people started asking if they could buy it, much to sort of my astonishment. And eventually um, I had a really nice little side hustle going and ended up moving to Florida. And that was sort of just kind of like 
post 9-11 and went and got my graduate degree. But while I was there, I had the audacity to put, and this is dating as well, put an ad in Yellow Pages. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I remember those. by the time I finished my graduate degree, I had sort of a fully fledged business going. And I have been designing and building furniture for the last 25, 30 years now. Oh, cool. That's incredible. So that that's how I started. But along the way, um, I started having people coming, asking me if I could teach them how to build furniture and teach them how to woodwork. And so that began by onesie twosies mm -hmm. and became fours and fives and tens and twelves. And so back in 2017, I set up the school as it's a, standalone entity and we have been teaching as a full-time school since 2017. Wow. That's incredible. Could you tell us a little bit about the school's programming or your philosophy on what kinds of classes you bring in? Yeah. So we have a program that begin brings people in at the very beginning where they don't necessarily know whether a joiner or a planer or a hand saw. And we take them all the way through to complex project builds. We're a little bit different from other schools in that we do this in, in bite-sized segments. So rather than coming for multiple weeks at a time, you come, take a class, go back home, solidify those skills, come back and take the next bite. So it's so the school is designed for people who have other lives, you know, that they have <laughs> jobs that they have to do. And um, we make sure that the school is fully equipped, that they don't have to bring any tools with them, that we have everything that they need. So we have a really diverse student base that comes from across the United States, a little bit that's international. Um, but we we have a um, really have a really good crowd of folks here that sort of span a lot of different demographics. And it's uh, also we we've, we've had the wonderful thing of, of of getting just incredible instructors in, right? And and maybe it's because we're in Florida that you ask them if you want to ask, come to Florida in the winter that they go like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can identify but, with um, that. Yeah, so you, yeah, you'll find folks like Phil Morley and Frank Straza, who's going to be in the master class. And um, they are just part of our regular cadre of teachers. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Well, speaking of stacked shop with incredible equipment, um, Kate, you were kind enough to record us your shop tour. We do this every week for our community. So today we're showing off Kate's shop tour from the Florida School of Woodwork. Let's do it. We sprung that one on Goose. Sorry, Goose. <laughs> it's coming, everybody. <laughs> Here we go. Hey, welcome to the Florida School of Woodwork. I want to give you guys a quick tour around and show you the workspaces we have. So come on in. And while we're doing this, everybody, ask questions for Kate the in the Q&A. three main areas. And you're in the main workshop area. And this is where we have all the student benches. Um, and we have bench crafted benches and you'll also see that at each station we have a little toolkit so students can come in without having to bring all their tools with them. So as we go on through the shop, you can see that we have some of the equipment up here. We've got the bands that we've got, usually got double if not triple of most machinery. So we've got band saws, the, plane the planers and the joiners. We've also got the saw stop table saws over here, which, you know, we love having. The instructor has a main teaching area up at the front, and then we've also got the big TVs so that uh, if we want to get really close in and detailed on what's going on, we can do that. So let's go to the back and let me show you some of the other areas as we get there. So we have a little break room area where folks can grab a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, we also have what we refer to as the basket of evil that has tons of really bad for you snacks. And down the back 
here we have our lumber storage and uh, some, some additional machinery. So we have things like our drill presses, we do our lumber prep back here, and we also have the miner stations. Um, we store some of the equipment here, so we have the saw horses hanging up, um, but we do come back here and work on things like the router stations um, and uh, the mortising machines. One of the nice areas that we have for just hanging out and having fun is our little, we call it industrial New Orleans, but we have a little courtyard out here that has both uh, plants where you can fill with greenery and a little picnic area. Uh, we call it industrial because we've got the wonderful chain link fence back here which is perhaps not the sweetest. But anyway, we really look forward to seeing you. Um, we hope you'll come and join us for the Shape of event. It's just going to be just an awesome blast. Lovely mix of modern technology and traditional hand tools. Can't wait to see you here. Awesome. What Thank an so much. incredible space. Just the way, I, I love the way it's laid out too. Yeah. It seems very clean and organized. Goose, Kate's still here. Let's bring her video back on. There we go. Okay. <laughs> what a beautiful shop. Holy smokes. Yeah. Lovely uh, building that's built in the 1920s. Yeah. Very high ceiling. Uh, so lots of his history in the space. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple questions for you from the audience. Uh, first question is from Crystal. This is a deep one. When you were pursuing your master's, had you already decided to continue on with the woodworking field or did you get your master's in something completely unrelated? Um, so my master's was completely unrelated. And um, I mostly did it because I didn't know anybody in my industry when I moved to Tampa. But as I started to do more woodwork, I was just, it was just really something that it, uh, head, you know, head and heart and hands is just it's a phenomenal uh, vocation to be in. Yeah, yeah. We so it that. just kind of took over. <laughs> it has a way of doing that. It has a way of doing that. Um, we, yeah, everybody's always curious about different people's journeys. We've got a lot of questions about that. Uh, kind of nuts and bolts question from Neil is how many students can you accommodate at the school? Yeah, so in regular class, we have 12. Mm -hmm. That makes, uh, ensures that for us, that the instructor has time to engage with every student. Mm -hmm. So it might be safe to say that the master class is going to be one of the bigger events that be you've busy. done. With uh, 60 will, people there yeah. total. Um, <laughs> heads up for the audience, we are literally renting the theater next door as yeah. well. So we're going to have some extra space. We're going to do yeah. Frank Straza's hand tool marketry class in there along with, you know, food and drinks and stuff. Um, and a question for me, whose dog is that? That dog is adorable. <laughs> so that's Wiley. Um, and he's one of the shop dogs. We are about to get another dog, another Wiley. Um, but he, but he only has three legs. Oh, oh, that's adorable. So maybe he's like three and a half dogs. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's the hardest thing about a chair is balancing, you know, making sure all the legs are even. Three, three legged stools are easier to make. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Kate. We're so excited to come meet you and come work in your in, incredible shop. Great. Um, Really and, excited. And have some classes. Th and thank you also for joining us. I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody. Yeah, yeah. great. Thanks, um, Kate. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. That was fun. Yeah, that was cool. God, I'm excited to see that to space. that dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, incredible machinery in there. Yeah. Um, it's making me jealous. We might move to Florida. We need uh, carving horses. We do need some carving so horses. Having them up on the wall like that. Okay, enough daydreaming. Right. We've got a whole second half of this show to do. <laughs> All right. So we, uh, man, I'm so distracted now. We cut the first half of this thing. We cut this whole piece, but we did it one way. We did it kind of the way that we had done in the previous show, which was to lay everything flat, have a lot of extra material, um, and just use all that extra space to kind of eyeball things with origin. So today we're bumping that up a level. We're going to cut our, uh, we're going to cut our material to size first. 
we're actually going to go into Studio to break out this specific file um, to find out what dimensions we need and everything and to align it, to be able to align it all. And we're actually going to pre-cut our dimensions to the right size. Yeah. Um, and we have a fun thing that we're going to bring on the bench here in just a minute that's going to let us do that on the show for the first time. But we need to figure out the size But we first. need to do the size first. Okay, okay, okay. Um, all right. So, uh, oh, you know what? And we had not mentioned other plastics, but we should come back to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's hop over here to Shaper Studio. Okay, so this is Shaper Studio. This is our simplified digital design tool for craftspeople. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go in and make a new design. We're going to... That's the design from the last session that we did. Now, if you remember, the file on origin had a bunch of parts in it, and we're going to use Studio to break out those parts. The way that I'm going to do that is by first importing that file from my files. This is how you import things into Studio from ShaperHub. Save them to your files first, and then import them here. So I'm going to click on that. And then that project is going to be here under Candy Machine candymachine.svg. Perfect. I'm going to import that. And in this case, I want all of these shapes to be unlinked to each other because I'm going to delete a bunch of them. So I'm going to do that as an exploded import. If I do these all together, what that's going to mean is if I try to delete one thing, it's going to delete all these shapes together. I want to parse out this centerpiece, so I'm going to explode this. See, 142 objects. Nice. So let's do that. I can zoom out here. And I'm just going to get rid of stuff here. So to select multiple, you can click and drag, then hit delete. Over here, I'm also going to click, hold, and drag, and then delete. And then to get rid of this thing in the middle here, it just says clear acrylic. I'm going to drag over that. and. I don't want to get rid of this outer uh, profile, so I'm going to go into the selection manager over here. So this is where we can pick subsets of our selection. Click into there. I'm going to deselect this, which is my outer shape. Cool. I can delete that. And now here, we are just left with this original shape. I'm going to name this something nice. I'm going to call this acrylic piece. How about that? Hit enter to save. And the cool thing about this is that it is always saving and it's going to be automatically synchronized to origin. Now, Jake, I see you waiting for the overall dimensions. So what I can do is click this. This gives me my overall dimensions. If you missed that, I just clicked on this outer box here and we've got six by 12. Six by 12, okay. There we go. Six by 12. Thanks. Do you have the acrylic, sir? I do have the acrylic. It's right over here. We kind of missed the big reveal here. You hoisting that thing up onto the table. I what know. is that contraption? This is the Festool Sissaw. Holy smokes. This thing is crazy. And it is wonderful for cutting acrylics because it comes with a very fine tooth blade. Yeah. Uh, which when sawing acrylics, you need a, a fine tooth, not too big of a kerf. Yep. And... To avoid melting. It's to portable, avoid so we can bring it into the studio. Yeah. A compact, battery-powered table saw that fits in a sustainer and is super accurate. Super accurate and quiet. So our height, keep that a little higher than our material. Nice. And you see that I've got the corner marked for the reference square there. Square corner. Yep, square corner. Nice. Excellent. So we're going to do just 6 by 12. I'm going to just hang out here. This Perfect. is going to be fast. What I absolutely love about this saw is the sliding table fe table feature. Mm -hmm. Cause sometimes you just that action is just the wow. <laughs> it makes me so happy. All right, and by twelve. By twelve. You're gonna measure this out. I didn't bring a measuring tape. Here's one. Thank you. Yep. Gotcha.
Got a pencil? Need a pencil? Got one. Man always has a pencil. Gotta keep your pencil on you. All right. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> Beautiful. That's incredible. I'm going to say Seth Joe's us lunch for showing this thing on our show. <laughs> Tuck this away. Yeah, very packable. Pretty cool. So let's see. Don't get rid of too much of that acrylic because what we need to do now is construct what we call a tape board. Yes. And this is the difference between what we've done in the last demo on this show and in the demos on the previous show where we just got a bunch of oversized material and we, you know, laid out tape in front of Origin. We didn't really care how much material we were wasting. In this case, we've got our material, which is exactly the right size. But what that means is we need to construct a tape board, which is a field of tape on the same plane as our material, a little bit in front of Origin. Is it cheating if I use the old stuff? No, no, that's fine. It's already got tape on it. It's already got tape on it. It's nice and big. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to put this out ahead of me. Mm-hmm. Now, then... The key to this, using a tape board, you basically putting your shaper tape on another object that's not the thing you're cutting, is one, it's got to be the same thickness. Two, you've got to make sure that they don't move independently of each other mm -hmm. because that messes the whole, your, whole, uh, your whole world up. Yeah, but just a little bit of double-sided tape will do it. At least two strips, one strip, usually not enough. It can pivot on that. Two strips, usually pretty good. That's fine. Put it this way. Um, I would do it... We do it vertically, mm -hmm. just for ease of use, since that's how our file's oriented. Cool. And okay, a little bit of tape on that thing. And now, note, if you want to make a fixture, a repeatability, you might try to align this with like a mark on your tape board. We're not actually going to cover that today. We're going to cover repeatable fixturing with Workstation on the next show. So for this, we're going to teach you how to use a grid. The important thing to remember is that this piece actually doesn't need to be aligned very precisely to the tape board at all, even though Jake's doing it very precisely. Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be. It could be completely angled, and the grid is going to accommodate for all of that. Cool. Cool. Looks good. I am going to add one more strip of tape just right there because we cut through a lot. Got some tape? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, a little extra tape never hurts. Uh, if you're ever in doubt, you could always scan and see what your tape health meter says, you know? Um, but it never hurts to add an extra row right off the bat. Okay, we are scanning just like we've done for uh, every other part that we've made. You do want to make a new scan because it's going to capture the new tape that we added um, because you're changing the orientation of everything here. We flip that piece kind of facing the other direction and it's going to capture the new piece that we added of material in that image. Yes, it is. You'll see after we scan that pops you directly into design mode. And now what we're going to do to align our template to this piece of material is we're going to make a grid. And I would say that for this, we should make a grid with that engraving bit upside down, which we don't really have set up quite yet actually for this one but it'll be pretty quick to do. So what we recommend for uh, gridding is to use your engraving bit flipped upside down in that quarter inch collet. Um, any engraving bit will do. We're going to use the 90 degree engraving bit and that gives you a nice solid 0 0.2500 inch diameter shank um, that you can use to probe off of your material with and this will all make a little more sense in just a minute. Yeah, because if you wouldn't show the origin cam real quick, engraving bit, sharp side in, just finger tight on that. Okay. 
we're going into grid, new grid. Now here, last time where, uh, yeah, we do want to change the diameter on that. Last time where we had not set the depth and we just kind of double clicked wherever we happened to be. This time we are going to lower that router bit down so that it is just below the plane of our material. And you can't see it on the image because we didn't scan quite far back enough. I'm going to suggest just for the purposes of the demo that we go ahead and add to scan there just so you can kind of see that edge. Put a little more tape on that. Just to help clarify, you don't need to be able to see the edge of your workpiece. Um, Origin will make a grid just fine, but it does help for purposes of visualization. Yeah, there we go. And this is the beauty of that add to scan. You can always add just a little bit more. Let's see if we got the bottom of it. Almost. Not quite. There we go. Hey, there we go. A couple extra dominoes helps us get all the way to the bottom. It's looking out ahead of itself about 16 inches and then directly to the front of origin. So that's kind of the range that you have. Mm -hmm. All right, grid. we're going to make that grid. We're going to set that depth so that that router bit just comes down below origin's base so that it can touch off against the edge of that material. And you can see when Jake brings that router bit all the way into contact with the edge, he can click that green button. He probed once. Now he's going to probe a second time to make that X axis. And then he's going to come around the corner and probe a third time to make that Y axis. So you've got a nice square X, Y coordinate system relative to the corner of your workpiece. Now, when we go ahead and import, Here we go, we should have a new design right at the top. And we should be able to grab the bottom left anchor point on that one. What do you think? Does that look like that makes sense? Yep, perfect. Bam. Nice. Now we know that that is snapped to the physical material. Our edges are square, so that's all gonna line up nicely. Yeah. Um, I would say we should go ahead and cut this out. Probably take less than five minutes if I just let you rip on it. What do you think? I think I can do it in one five. Okay, cool. So we're going to start with, what, that 16th inch bit? And we can do the screw clearance holes, and we can use the 16th inch bit to do the handle clearance hole? Yep. So we'll do the 16th inch bit first. We'll come back with the 90 degree engraving bit, and we'll get those countersinks. And then we will come back with the eighth inch O flute and get just that last little bit of material that we need to remove on the bottom here. Now, remember, we already cut the rest of this to size previously on the table saw. So all Jake's going to need to cut is this little part right down here. Should be pretty fast. Got that 16th inch bit in there. Nice. Might need to change that to an inside cut. Helix. Let's go a little. All right. Nice. Here we go. Okay. Off to the races. And I'll try to keep track of what Jake's doing as he goes through it. So again, like we were doing for those screw clearance holes, we are helixing this uh, handle clearance hole just because it's nice and easy. Origin's doing all the work. Jake isn't even moving the thing. He doesn't even need to hold down the button. He just click that button to helix and off it goes. We'll do the same thing for all of these screw clearance holes. You did forget to hit helix there, I think. There we go. Just because helix is a little bit easier on that router bit than trying to take that full depth all in one go. It really eases into it. It spirals down continuously as you go. So even though it's pretty quick, um, it's really only taking off a couple hundredths of an inch of material. 
at any given time. You can see on Origin's camera the edge of the material over there as it lines up with the grid lines, which is pretty slick to see. And as always, if you have any questions, make sure you ask those in the chat. Uh, once we're done with this demo, I think we're going to roll into our origin question and answer segment. So we'll answer some questions, we'll do those giveaways, uh, then we'll call it a wrap. Speed running now. I think you're unmuted. What was that? I said I'm speed running now. Safely. Hey, Jake. Not sure that that Z touched. Because you got that warning, right? You might have speed run it a little too quick. There we go. Now, all right, going back to this, we've got those same settings that we used earlier. We've got that 0.05 inch depth. We've got that 0.02 inch bit diameter. And again, that's accommodating for that little flat bit on the tip of the router bit. Even though it looks like a sharp router bit, um, and it is a sharp router bit, there is a little flat spot on the end of each of these engraving bits. It would be awful fragile if they were perfectly, perfectly sharp. Um, that's going to be an inside cut, and Jake is using auto lock on these to go right down to that final depth and then zip around the perimeter of that circle. I was about to say, let's see if he notices that depth. So just a quick little roughing and then finishing pass here. A roughing pass with a 0.02 inch offset, just to give him a little bit of buffer. Uh, and then we'll come back with a zero inch offset just to finish that little bit out right there. And this is all that we need to cut on the perimeter. This is both material saving and time saving because we did it on the table saw. We kind of call this hybrid cutting. Um, you know, it can be really convenient to just do all this stuff with Origin, especially if you're on a job site, or maybe you don't even have a table saw. You know, it's a really great multi-purpose tool just to have Origin in your shop. Uh, but if you do have a table saw and it's set up to cut plastics, then it can, yeah, sometimes save you a bit of time. Sweet. Very cool. Looks good. Yeah, let's just peel that up. The big reveal.
That looks great. That's awesome. We're going to need more Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> After all these candy machines. Cool. All right. All right. There's one more thing. I thought we were at the end, but there is one more thing I want to talk about. Oh, yeah. It's just kind of a variety of plastics. You know, like there's other plastics out there in the world. We use acrylic a lot on the show. It's flashy. It's clear. It comes with this nice paper backing on it. Which um, is really nice. But I do want to show you guys just a couple more options and a couple places to buy this stuff because plastic is not necessarily the kind of thing that you can go to your local Home Depot and buy. You can, but like you might be, specialty plastics. You might be stretching it. Yeah, specialty plastics. And there's a whole world out there. So let's pop over to the laptop here. I want to show you two suppliers. One is Tap Plastics. And I went here to just cut to size plastics. This is sheets that they will cut down to size for you, or you could buy a whole sheet from them. And they've got all kinds of stuff. They've got acrylic. They've got HDPE, polyethylene. They've got recycled acrylic. They've got all kinds of stuff on here. Um, so this is where we buy our plastics. They have stores in most cities. Uh, and then the other place that I look, if you're looking for something super niche, is McMaster Car. This is a great industrial supplier. Uh, we can scroll down here to materials. This is also where we buy our brass from. We can scroll down to raw materials here and you'll see plastics. Okay, Ooh, hit the back button. Let's go back to plastics. Raw materials, plastics, there we go. We've got within plastics, we've got all kinds of stuff. We've got literally plastics. We also have some different composites here, rubber, foams, okay. Um, you can cut a lot of this stuff with Origin. I would say maybe even all of this stuff, things like carbon fiber, um, you are gonna want to make sure you have the right router bitch, which is maybe like a diamond grit abrasive router bit, and also make sure that your dust collection is on point because this stuff's really bad for your lungs. The only one on here that I would say you can't cut is rubber, <laughs> right? Like rubber, rubber. But we have done linoleum for stamp making. It's true. So there's a whole world out there. But we're talking about plastics. Let's go into this plastics tab. And I'm going to say you can cut every single thing that comes up on this page with Origin. And they all just have different properties, okay? To narrow this down, I'm just going to filter for sheets. Okay, polyethylene. The cool thing about this, it tells you what it's good for. This stuff's recycled and it's slippery. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you want slippery plastic? This is perfect. That's polyethylene for you. Okay, let's scroll down a little more. Easy to machine. That sounds great for Origin. Delrin Acetyl Resin. Okay, this stuff's really easy to cut. Downside to this stuff is it doesn't really come in a clear option. Okay, so we couldn't use it for this project. Okay, back to the laptop. We've got wear-resistant nylon. So if you want something super strong and wear-resistant, you could use nylon. That's cuttable with Origin. All right. Moisture resistant polyethylene HDPE. Um, this stuff's great. We use it here. Tap Plastics uh, sells a version called Starbond, right? Mm -hmm. um, or Starboard. Starbond. Starboard. Starbond yeah. is the glue company, yeah. right? Starboard, which is a great pun. It's marine plastic. Starboard. I should remember that. Oh, Get it? Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. Let's pull one more example out of here. Okay. Uh, one more. PVC. Okay, PVC is what maybe a lot of like kitchen appliance shells are made out of. It's lightweight. It's really flexible. So it's going to say, hey, oh, wow, of course, right. Impact and chemical resistant. So like you put baking soda on it, it doesn't matter. If you drop it from the countertop, it doesn't matter. It's lightweight. It's inexpensive. PVC. It's great for that. <laughs> okay. Cool. There we go. It's a lot of different plastics. It's a lot of different plastics. There's even more. We're not even halfway down the page here. But yeah. Anything on this plastics page you can cut with Origin, give it a browse. Just see what's in there. Thanks, everyone. See you then. Bye.